Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Good morning. Uh, Welcome to virtual church at Westminster Presbyterian in Dallas. Uh, It feels a little bit too much like 2020 uh, today, Um, so we're glad that you all are uh, heeding the message to worship from home. If if it is possible to worship from home, um, we're going to be doing that for this week and next week. Um, We do have a couple people in the sanctuary. We are not turning anyone away from the sanctuary. We encourage you to stay home, but uh, if you're not able to worship online, uh, please come uh, and worship here in the sanctuary where we can socially distance uh, and, and wear masks. Um, so even though we are connected primarily through the internet, this is still the day that the Lord has made. We will still rejoice and be glad in it. Today is uh, Baptism of Christ Sunday, and so let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship God together. Wherever you are, I invite you to take a moment and to be still, to focus on your breath, to focus on God's spirit, which is the source of being and to breathe in deeply together. And out. We breathe God's Holy Spirit in, and we breathe out our worship and our praise.
You're invited to rise in body or in spirit and join in the call to worship. From the north and south we come. From the east and west God calls us. Over the rising waters and the Lord, the Lord, the mighty waters, the Lord speaks. I've called you by name. You are mine. Gracious God, in Jesus Christ, baptized John, by John in the Jordan, you came to share our lives and deliver us from sin and death. As we are baptized with water, pour out your Holy Soap Spirit upon us to make us your beloved children. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. John's voice cries out in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Repent, for God's kingdom has come near. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin. God, our Redeemer, <laughs> we confess that our lives do not reflect your glory. You walk with us in times of trial, but we abandon others in trouble. You pour out your love for us, but we fail to share in your mercy. Forgive us, God of grace, 
Send us your Holy Spirit to cleanse and create us so that we may honor your name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And when Jesus came out of the waters, the clouds opened and the Holy Spirit descended like a dove and there was a voice from heaven that said, you are my chosen, you are my beloved, with you I am well pleased. And God said, when you go through the waters, I will be with you, or through the fires, I will be be with you because I love you. You are mine. This is the most important thing that is going to happen perhaps during the entire service today, to remember that you are the beloved to remember that you belong to God, to remember that God loves you no matter what. Children of God, hear and believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. printed the bulletins before we made the decision to tell people to worship from home. So I'm going to take a moment and pass the piece to the Kenothes and to uh, our worship leaders. As you are worshiping online, I hope that you will uh, type something in the chat box and let us know that you are here um, and share God's peace remotely um, with one another.
source of our calling. Your word is full of power and glory. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us so that may we receive your grace and live as your beloved children through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first reading is from Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 through 7. Listen to God's word. But now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers they will not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, the fire (laughs) will not be burned, and the flames shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give ransom Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Sebia, in exchange for you, because you are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. I give people in return for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring out your offerings from the east and from the west. I will gather you. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from far away, and for my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your service, in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our second scripture lesson comes from Luke's Gospel, chapter 3, verses 15 through 17 and 21 through 22. Listen again for God's word. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water. But one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Y'all, this has not been the week that I expected to have at the beginning of the year. I think like most of you, I look forward to the new year, especially as it comes after the time of holidays and rest. You're going to get off to a good start, you're going to be productive, you're going to get things done around the house, you're going to get things done at church or at work. And then this COVID thing came out of, well, I shouldn't say came out of nowhere, but the Omicron wave came out of nowhere, seemingly. Our kids were both coughing and sneezing and it was it was so gross that Monday that first Monday of the year and we just said we are not going to be the parents that send their kids back to daycare with them coughing everywhere as the COVID numbers are rising so we 
kept them home, which means we weren't going to work. And then they said we need to get a negative COVID test. So we take them to the doctor and we wait for the test to come back. And it does come back negative on Wednesday. So they were out Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. There goes those first three days of productivity. Then we send them to school, back to daycare on Thursday. And I mean, on Thursday, it was like I got a whole week's worth of work done in one day. I was so productive on Thursday. But then Friday morning, get the phone call. Kids in each of their classes, individually, separately, have tested positive. So Friday, they're back home, and here we, are, here we go once again. I should say that their tests came back negative. We haven't had any symptoms, Kathy uh, or I. Um, but it, it just seems like it's deja vu all over again. And I don't know what it is, but there's something about me that is so hopeful in the midst of all of this. Hopeful that on the one hand, I've seen public health folks talk about how this Omicron wave could be hopefully the last wave and that it's infecting lots of people and that it it will be difficult. We need to take precautions because even if the rate of hospitalizations is is uh, lower, the rate of infections is so much higher that we still need to be, to be cautious. But hopefully this is the beginning um, of the end. But on the other hand, as we made the decision to tell people to, to worship from home and all of a sudden, you know, flights are getting canceled uh, and schools are going through the same dance again, it's almost like we kind of get a do-over for this pandemic to bring us together as a people in the way that it didn't the first time. In a way that when the pandemic first started, instead of this being this, this national or international crisis that was going to overcome all of the other you know, barriers and divisions that we had uh, before, and this was going to transcend it, and we, we would come together out of this shared uh, threat, it deepened those divisions. And now we have another chance. Now we have Another chance. That's what I was thinking as I was making another trip on that Friday from uh, my house to the preschool to pick my kids up again. Now we have another chance to get through these next couple weeks with shared sacrifice and come on the other side of this. Come on the other side of this seeing people, though they have different news sources or different approaches to public health or to life than than we do, but to see them still as people created in the image of God. Because that is what baptism is about. I'm, I'm using this this opportunity of baptism of the Lord Sunday to talk about baptism in general. I read one commentator that points out, especially in kind of a post-Christendom world, not everybody really understands what baptism is about. And we have some churches that only baptize adults. We have some churches that baptize infants. And we have some people that can be baptized in a church and sort of never see, the church never sees them again, this is an opportunity to talk about what baptism is. And so if there's nothing else that you take away from today, take away this, that baptism is the visible sign of something that was already true before time began which is that God loves you and that God loves the whole world, that everybody, because of baptism, is worthy of God's love, made in the image of God. 
So keep that in mind as, as I say first that baptism is primarily about God's activity. Especially in the Presbyterian world, baptism is something God does rather than something we do. Baptism is God saying that my grace, my love claims you before you are ever aware, before you can ever say yes, my grace, my love goes before. God is the actor when we perform a baptism. Then the second important point about baptism is that it's not an individual that responds, that it is a community that responds. When we baptize an individual baby or an individual adult for that matter, it is the community being reminded again of that love of God and then being challenged to welcome in new people to the community and to treat one another as a community of people made in the image of God. A people that are so in love with loving that that love overflows outside the community itself and into the rest of the world. That is what baptism is about. It's not about saving individual souls or, or individual people from heaven and ding, one more person got into, heaven, uh, got into heaven or got out of hell today. It is about remembering the absolutely radical, profound universality of God's love. And the challenge to us to see the world in the same way that God does, through the lens of that universal grace and universal love. The sort of one thing that I will point out about this text, you know, the the text that I just read, um, one part that always stands out is the part about the wheat that is going to be saved and the chaff that is going to be burned with unquenchable fire. Uh, And uh, the podcast that I love listening to, the preaching podcast, Pulpit Fiction, um, those guys point out that if you're really going to take that metaphor seriously, every plant, every wheat plant, every fruit plant has both wheat and chaff. It has both the grain and the shell. It's not like some plants are wheat and some plants are chaff. This burning away of the chaff to leave the wheat is the process of God's sanctification. It's the process of living into our baptism where everything within us as individuals that wants to practice selfishness, or wants to live according to a narrative of fear or retribution, that that is what's being burned away so that what remains is truly that image of Christ, that image that was present since creation. That's what baptism is about. It's it's about the sanctification, the repentance, the cleansing that happens within us. And, you know, make no mistake, it, for some people, you, it, it reminds me of that, uh, I don't know, I can't remember what the meme is on, on Facebook, but there's a, or what the point of the meme is, but it's a picture of an avocado that is giant, on the outside and then you cut it open and the pit is gigantic and there's this tiny little bit of fruit around it that you know for for some people you you burn away the chaff and maybe there's not much fruit left but there's still a little fruit there um we are all made in god's image 
And I started thinking about this when I read a New York Times uh, op-ed by the Christian theologian uh, and racial justice activist Michael Eric Dyson. Uh, And I give that... um, description of him before I, that he's a a, a racial justice activist, advocate, before I read the title of his um, op-ed, because the title is a little clickbaity, if you will. The the title, uh, to me, um, is overly uh, divisive, I guess. The title of his op-ed is, Where is the Forgiveness in Cancel Culture? And so he writes about this way that forgiveness, grace, has been something that historically has been intrinsic to uh, civil rights movements, intrinsic to who we are as a people and as a nation, but that in recent years, forgiveness grace has fallen out of fashion a little bit. It is all about we are complete accountability, complete retribution. We see those who are committing injustices, who have things in their past that uh, did violence to another person or to a community, and we would literally crucify them if we could. That that is what it looks like to, to, to be a person on, on the side of, of justice is retributive justice and focusing on accountability and canceling, if you will, other people rather than looking to redeem them or looking to welcome them back into the community. And so Michael uh, Eric Dyson points to the example of uh, Mother Emanuel Church in Charleston, which you'll remember several years back was the site of a horrible massacre when a white supremacist came to a Bible study, sat down, read scripture with preachers and elders and members of the congregation, and then opened fire and killed scores of them. And there was this powerful moment as this man was captured, apprehended, put on trial, and said he did this because he wanted to start a race war. And he was thwarted of that war during his sentencing when the people of the church forgave him. Now, they didn't want him to go free. They didn't want him to have no accountability at all for the heinous thing that he had done. But they refused to give in to the same darkness, to the same hatred that had so captured him. They refused to be imprisoned by that same dark view and hatred of the other. Dyson calls this an example of restorative justice. He talks about forgiveness in, uh, I've got to find this quote, in this way. Forgiveness is not a weak ethical response to grave dangers. It is a calculated effort to ward off moral harm by anticipating the destructive impact of unforgiving attitudes, behaviors, and actions. He calls restorative justice the most sustainable model for social change. The goal, the goal of the Charleston church forgiving uh, Dylan Roof is for reflection, restrictions, and rules to lead to even slight transformation. 
The death penalty, which would be ultimate retributive justice, is the harshest and most unjust punishment to impose. While it may be exceedingly difficult to rehabilitate murderers, it is impossible to restore dead ones. Friends, that is the radicalness of the gospel, is that no one is forever out of reach of God's love. No one is beyond the hope of transformation. No one. Now, if you're like me, you're thinking of all sorts of objections, right? All sorts of people who uh, we want to say, but what about this person? Maybe it's someone who uh, did unthinkable harms to lots of people across the world. Or maybe it's someone who did something unspeakable to you. But the thing about forgiveness is like baptism, it is a communal act. Forgiveness is something that we can't all be capable of individually at all times, but it is allowing someone who has harmed an individual or a community to be open to transformation by the community. I think we get in trouble when we hear these stories sometimes of these radical forgiveness of, of um, and, and maybe it's the story of people uh, like the, the, the killer in Charleston being forgiven face to face by those church members. Only there are some that go even further where something unspeakable happened, there was an act of forgiveness, and then those people became friends, and they started having coffee, and they started getting lunch together every week, and we think that's what forgiveness or reconciliation is supposed to look like? No, that's not necessarily what reconciliation and forgiveness is supposed to look like. Maybe that person is only going to be getting coffee uh, in prison um, as they think about their crimes. But forgiveness is saying that this person's soul, this person's life is being left to God, that I am going to relieve myself of the burden of judgment and retribution. I'm going to lay that down. I'm also perhaps going to lay down ever having to think about or see this person again because they're being held accountable for what they've done wrong. They're being held apart. They're being held where you and the rest of society can be safe and cannot uh, be threatened once again by a similar unspeakable harm. But that that is what baptism is about. And that is why baptism is so central to our faith and why I think the theology of baptism, the understanding of baptism, must be central to what we are about as a people, as a community, as a nation. Baptism is a reminder of the chasm that exists between who we are and what we act like. It's a reminder of the chasm that exists between who we are and what we act like. Who we are is beloved by God. That passage that Gil read is 
actually the only place in Scripture where you hear it explicitly. God says from the, the mouth of God, I love you. And this is being directed to, uh, to Israel, who had disobeyed God, who had abandoned God's covenant, who had done unspeakable things to their neighbors, um, who, were, who deserved God's total condemnation and were experiencing accountability for their crimes. But it was God saying in the midst of that, I still love you. And so forgiveness bridges that chasm between who we are and what we do in two directions. Forgiveness refuses to allow what we have done to eclipse who we are. Forgiveness refocuses the dialogue, the discussion on who we are instead of what we have done. And forgiveness gives us a higher aim for what to do in the future. That is, forgiveness is something to practice. We hear that we are beloved, that what we are is bigger and beyond anything that we've ever done. Because we have received forgiveness. And when we know that, when we can understand that down to our bones, that compassion overflows. And we are able to practice forgiveness. And forgiveness then makes our actions come closer in line to what we were created to be. Children of God, made in the image of love, worthy of love, created to love. I'm going to conclude with a story that many of you probably have heard before, but I hadn't heard um, before this week. Uh, it is the story of a football game uh, between Grapevine Faith High School and Gainesville State School. That was a game that started in a very peculiar way. Gainesville State football players running through a banner made by fans, parents of Grapevine High School, of Grapevine Faith School. It continued with these Gainesville State players being cheered for by the fans of Grapevine Faith School because Gainesville State was a juvenile penitentiary. The students on that football team had been convicted as children of horrible crimes, of violent crimes, of awful crimes. They played with second and third hand pads. They never had a home game. They always had away games. They were never cheered for. And so the coach of Grapevine Faith decided that he was going to send a message to his uh, team, to his school, to his fans, to his community, and said, we are going to assign half of our fans to learn the names of everyone on this team, to make signs for them, and to cheer for them in this game. Because no matter what they've done, they are bigger than what they have done. What they have done does not define them. What defines them is that they are children of God, that they are worthy of love. And the Gainesville State team lost the game to, to, to Grapevine Faith by multiple touchdowns, 
but they also scored multiple touchdowns, which was more touchdowns than they had scored during the rest of their season because they had never been cheered for before. They had always been the bad guy. They had always been the villain. They had always been the thugs who were doing their time because they had messed up and didn't deserve to be cheered for, didn't deserve to be on a real football team like other kids their age. That's just one story that I hope that we can remember, that I hope that you will tell, and that I hope that you will come away from this service remembering that you are loved. You are made of God's image. And God loves the whole entire world. And every time we touch this water, every time we baptize a child or an adult, we are proclaiming this radical, challenging countercultural truth that no one is beyond the reach of God's love and grace and redemption. Thanks be to God. Amen. Today's affirmation of faith comes from the Presbyterian Church Book of Order and the Directory for Worship. Wherever you are, please join me in saying it together. Baptism enacts and seals what the Word proclaims, God's redeeming grace offered to all people. Baptism is at once God's gift of grace, God's means of grace, 
and God's call to respond to that grace. Through baptism, Jesus Christ calls us to repentance, faithfulness, and discipleship. Through baptism, the Holy Spirit gives the church its identity and commissions the church for service in the world. You may be seated. Well, friends, uh, wherever you are worshiping with us today, once again, uh, let me say welcome uh, and that you are home here at Westminster Presbyterian Church. Um, the uh, online bulletin does have a list of announcements for ways that you can get involved in the life of our congregation. Um, I do hope uh, that you will, if you have not made a pledge to Westminster for 2022, to get um, a pledge in as we are trying to finalize our budget for this year. And stay tuned uh, to your email uh, for an upcoming date of a congregational meeting uh, when we will um, reveal the, uh, the budget approved by the session, as well as elect a nominating committee uh, for elders to serve on the next session class um, and have kind of a general uh, state of Westminster, uh, if you will, um, report about uh, the life and the future of the church is that there's so much um, exciting going on here and so much to look forward to uh, in the coming year. Um, we do want to uh, continue to pray for um, members uh, who have been uh, diagnosed with COVID. We have uh, multiple people in the Westminster family who have been diagnosed uh, or who have been exposed. We have um, other folks who um, are recovering from surgery uh, or um, preparing uh, for, for surgery. Uh, and so we hope that you will um, keep those people uh, in your prayers. Um, we come now uh, to a time of offering and sharing not only our, uh, our gifts, but our prayers um, and our celebrations and our concerns. Um, you can give to the church uh, through uh, Venmo. You can give to the church by mailing a check or by um, sending a check to the church office. Um, so we have heard God's word proclaimed, and now we are invited to respond. And so I invite you uh, during this time to respond by making a gift and to respond by, um, in the Facebook chat, uh, sharing your own uh, prayer celebrations um, and concerns. Let us now offer our gifts and our prayers to God.
let us pray. Holy and loving God, we offer you our thanksgiving and our praise. We offer you our gifts, our time, our resources, our money. We offer you our faith, our doubts, our questions. We offer you our service, our sacrifice, and our love. Please accept these our gifts, though broken, though cracked, that they would nonetheless be acceptable to you, and that you would use them for your purposes to further grace, forgiveness, and love. We pray, O oh God, for the world you so love. Especially this day, we pray for the people of Kazakhstan and for others around the world who are living in the threat of violence, who are losing the freedom to express themselves and be the people that you created them to be. May we be witnesses for peace and for justice and for your love and grace given freely to all. O oh God, especially this day, we pray for those who are incarcerated. We pray for those who are awaiting sentencing. We pray for those who are awaiting execution. And we ask that you would send your spirit, that you would send your spirit of grace and love that all would know that they are worthy, that they are made in your image. And we pray for your spirit of transformation and repentance to turn hearts and to change minds and attitudes. That we and all would become new creatures in your Son, Jesus Christ. O oh God, this day we also pray for ourselves and members of our community who have been wounded by others. We pray for those who are not yet ready to forgive, that they would know that that forgiveness is not up to them, but up to you, that they would lay that burden down, and that you would bless them with the comfort and peace and worthiness that passes understanding. O oh God, this day we pray that you would be with those who do not know where they will sleep tonight. Those citizens of our city who have been unjustly marginalized because of the color of their skin, because of their size of their bank account, or because of where they do or do not worship. We ask that you would make us a people of forgiveness and love, that you would form us more and more each day into the image of your Son that is revealed in our baptism, and that your kingdom would come quickly, O oh God, that you would hasten the day when all would be made new, when all peoples would be reconciled, and when your gospel of love and grace and abundant life would be fully realized and made known in heaven as on earth. Hear us as we pray together the prayer of our faith. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
brothers and sisters, may you go from this place with just the slightest awareness of how fully and completely and forever loved you are in God's sight. And as you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the forgiveness of the Holy Spirit be with all of you now and forever. Amen. Thank you.